Hello, in this video I'll be going over number 51 through 60 from the June of 2024 ACT math test. For each question, if you have not already seen the test, you should press pause, read over the question, and then you can come back to the video. Okay, number 51, we're going to multiply two real numbers together, it says product, and we're going to get a non-zero rational number, so it can't be zero, but it has to be rational. What does rational mean? It's a number that can be written as a fraction, or if it's written as a decimal, the decimal stops at some point or becomes a repeating decimal. Okay, so let's take a look at these answers. Initially, I would think that if I multiplied two irrational numbers together, I would also get an irrational number. And that is usually the case, but check this out. Um, when you have the square root of a not perfect square, like all four of these, that's going to be an irrational number. If, if you do the square root of 2 in the calculator, you're going to get a long decimal, but that decimal really goes on forever without repeating and without stopping. All right, so we have this irrational number times this ir irrational number, and we get the square root of 36, which is 6, and 6 is definitely a rational number. Just like here, the square root of 3 times the square root of 3 is equal to 3. So A does work. Okay, for B, if you multiply two rational numbers together, you, you, you're going to get a rational number. Same thing with integers. If you multiply two integers together, you're going to get an integer. And an integer is definitely a rational number. Because like, can I write negative 5 as a fraction? Sure, negative 5 over 1. A D, one number is positive and the other one is negative. Well, this has absolutely nothing to do with being rational and non-rational. So that's not it. But then E, one number is rational and the other is irrational. Now, I can't really tell you the reason for this because I don't know it, but you just want to know that when you multiply a rational times an irrational, you will get an irrational number. Now, the only exception to what I just said is if that rational number has to be zero. So if you do zero times the irrational number, you will get zero, which is rational, but Zero is not non-zero. Zero, zero is, is zero. So this is still can't be true. So the answer is E. Okay. Remember, this is the setup for number 52 through 54. So each one of those three questions will refer back to this information here. So I suggest that you press pause, read over everything, look over everything, and then come back to the video. Okay. So number 52, how many periods does the pump complete in one hour. Well, a period is pretty much just how long it takes to make one complete cycle. Notice it goes up, down, up, down, up, down and then all of a sudden it starts over again. So nine is one period because it's just going to start over again. And that's nine seconds. Now this got cut off when I made the sheet, but this is uh, the time in seconds. And then this is the volume in gallons. Okay. So every nine seconds, this uh, this graph makes a, makes a complete cycle, like from here to there. They want to know how many times will that happen in one hour. Remember, this is seconds. Nine seconds is one full period. So we have to take an hour, which is 3,600 seconds. 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour. That would give you 3,600 seconds. Just divide that by nine, you'll get 400. So there's going to be 400 periods within one hour. Okay, they want to know the volume in the water after 51 seconds. So just for example, after four seconds, the volume is 30. After six seconds, the answer is 50. All right, but remember, we know that it's going to keep doing this little pattern over and over again every nine seconds. And nine times five is 45. So to get to 51 seconds, you're going to go through five complete cycles, okay? Now, 51 minus that 45, that leaves it with 6. That, that means after the 45 seconds, it's going to start over, like here, and then we have 6 more seconds, and so the volume will be 50 gallons. Okay, number 53. Again, be sure to read everything. Okay, that was a blunder. Let's move on to 54. Make sure you read over all of this. 
And that what they're pretty much saying is the second take pretty much follows the exact same pattern. You know, it goes up, what, 40 and then down 30 and then up 20, etc. Except that it starts off at 30 gallons instead of 20. So it's just going to be, it's just going to look like that. It starts at 30 and then continues the exact same pattern. So one of the following functions represents the volume in gallons of the water in the second tank t seconds after the pump is turned on. Well, I think it's basically going to be the original function for volume plus 10 because everything is just 10 gallons higher. So the answer will be F. Okay, good. number 55 is a pretty standard question on the ACT. Probably one out of every three tests has this. It's basically called a, a catch, tag, and release. Okay, and they give you all the information here. So this is basically how I work the problem. So there's a pond that has some fish in it, and that we don't know how many fish are in there. They want to get an estimate. So I'm going to let P stand for the population of the fish in the pond. This is what we're trying to figure out. Now, out of the whole pond, they now have 32 fish that have been tagged. So a bunch of fish in the pond, 32 are tagged. So 32 out of the entire population. So they let those fish swim around a bit, get all mixed around and everything. And then they went ahead and caught 60 fish from that pond, and none of them were tagged. They were tagged in the, the previous uh, part of this problem. So what we have right here is just a small sample of the entire pond. So when we have, whenever you have a sample of something bigger, you can just write a proportion like this. Now, how do you solve this proportion? The way I solve a proportion, I just multiply the two numbers that are diagonal, and then divide that answer by the number that is diagonal with the variable. That's the way I do it. And I get this first. I'm going to multiply that and that, put the equal sign in the middle, divide by P. I'm sorry, divide by 9. And I get the answer C, 213. Number 56 wants us to find the x coordinate of point A. Now notice that point A is one of two points where these two graphs intersect, and here's the two equations. Okay, so what I did was I took the equation for this parabola and I solved for y, so I just took the square root of both sides, I got this. The other equation is already solved for y, so since they y is right here and here, that means these two must be equal, hence the answer is k. Number 57. Go ahead and read the problem, then come back to the video. So we know that the next step here is going to be a 5 by 5 instead of a 4 by 4. And 5 times 8 is 40. So this is 40 millimeters by 40 millimeters. Now, if you know your metric system, a centimeter is a hundredth of a meter, a millimeter is a thousandth of a meter. So there's 10 millimeters in each centimeter. So the 40 millimeters is the same as 4 centimeters. So this is basically 4 centimeters by 4 centimeters. And so the area will be 16 square centimeters. Okay, number 58. Since there are 23 shirts and they give us these three probabilities, I'm thinking pretty much that there's 13 long sleeve, there's eight white, and there's three that are long sleeve and white. Whenever I have a problem like this, I like doing a Venn diagram, okay? And notice I put the three, I always put the, the and over overlap in there first. All right, now we decided that there are 13 long sleeve shirts. So that means I put a 10 here. Y10, if you look inside the long sleeve circle, I now have 13 people who have a long sleeve shirt. With the same reasoning, since there are eight white shirts, I would put a five right here for a total of eight white shirts. Now, if you add all this up, that'd be 13 plus five, which is 18. 
Okay, so it's 18 here, and 18 fits this description. Okay, that there'll be long sleeve or white or both. So that's all 18. So it's 18 out of the 23. Therefore, the answer is H. Okay, number 59 has to do with an ellipse. We just have to match this ellipse to the equation that goes with it. Remember, an ellipse is basically an oval shape. And this is the general equation for any ellipse. The x and y are just the variables x and y because we have the x and y axis. But h is the x-coordinate of the center of the ellipse. So in this case, the h would be 0. The k is the y-coordinate of the center. And that would also be 0. Okay, the 1 is just 1. Now, the a is equal to the lateral or the horizontal distance from the center, which is 8. And the b is the vertical distance up and down from the center. So b would be 5. But then 8 squared is 64, and b squared is 25, and x minus 0 is x, and y minus 0 is y. So the answer is e. Number 60. Which one of these statements must be true? It has to be true if this is what we're given. I will notice I had the, an A on both sides, so I subtracted A from both sides, and I got that the opposite of B is greater than B, because A is just canceled. Then I added B to both sides, and got that 0 is greater than 2B, because 1B plus 1B is 2B, and I divided by 2. I got 0 is greater than B, which also means that B is less than 0. So we know that B must be less than 0. So we know that this is true. Now for this one, A is greater than 0. That's saying that A is positive. Since we had the A on both sides and it went away, I'm thinking that A could actually be anything, positive or negative. So it's not going to be that. We don't know that that's true. It might be positive. It might not, but it must be positive. Now, is B less than A? Well, we don't know what A is, so we just don't know. It might be less than A, but we don't know. It must be. So the only one that we know is true is the second one here, so the answer is G. Okay, that's the end of this video.